Hey, it's Greg Shredder, and it's time to connect. Hey, Greg Schrader, how you doing, man? Great, great. Good to see you today. Yeah, thank you very much for taking the time to connect. I appreciate this. Um, it seems like we've been trying to get this thing together for a little while, but we got it, and uh, I appreciate you. Got a lot of questions for you. Uh, how you been? What you been up to lately? Oh, man, just trying to get back on the, my feet on the ground, doing the, doing, the same, doing the stuff I've always done, you know, trying to get back out and playing and writing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's just, it's been a slow get back to normal for me. Was was the pandemic pretty tough on you? Yeah, you know, it, we were just talking about this the other day. As 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 far, you know, I just told you I was coming back from traveling. And it's one of those things that I'm so used to for so many years of my life of like being out away from the house for you know several days in a row and then coming back. And it's one of those you know uh, double edged swords. You love being out, but you love being home. Kind of deal. Like you, you get home, you're like you're ready to go back out. Well, you couldn't go back out anymore, and so then you were just stuck in this, you know. And it really kind of, I got a lot of cabin fever, I guess, like, is what you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and you know, it seems like it was a great time to ride. I was actually fairly prolific during that time, but I've talked to a number of people who said you would think so, but for me, it just wasn't. I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't was, ride. Much. It wasn't for me because it wasn't stimulating it was like trying like i enjoy, i get ideas and stuff from moving and moving around and, and being around different situations and different people and when i sit stagnant it's just, i don't do work i'm not good at it <laughs> you know? well hallelujah man we're, we're we're back in the saddle and i see you're you've been gigging a lot i, I see it i've looked at your gig schedule and it, it, i'm glad to see you're out and about and i want to ask you about that i want to ask you about your songwriting and the recordings you have out there and hopefully you you've got something else in the works um and i'll obviously i want to ask you about the movie too man um uh that's can you believe that's wow that's four years ago that thing came out yeah you know and what's crazy about that is that it's actually the process of that actually started <laughs> almost eight years ago wow I, I we i mean just to kind of from that my buddy josh that made the that wrote and directed and made the film we had gone to new york to get i had a song that, that i wrote called dear new york and i wanted to do a video and i was like i don't want it to be in new york city mm -hmm. Long story short, we were going there. Uh, anyway, I had some shows to play. And then I said, well, why don't you come up? And we shot this gorilla style in New York City. And when we got back, he was like, man, I have so much footage. I feel like I can make a movie. And then and then, a couple months later, he goes, hey, I'm making a movie. I said, great. He goes, you're in it. And I go, oh, OK. <laughs> you know, it's, you're not I, only in it you're the star of it <laughs> right and at, the, and at the time i didn't think of i didn't think i just said yes that's one of those things i've found in my career is that you just say yes mm -hmm. you know and sort it out at the end because i wasn't expecting it you know when you i've had friends do independent movies and you you got okay well it's just going to be this little independent film and it was i mean we made it for a little of no money but it went to festivals and a lot of festivals and won yeah. some stuff, you know, and it was so it's like it really became a lot more than what I ever envisioned it was going to be. Well, but again, but again, it was a it was a four year process up to the point of being or five year process up to the point of being able to be made. And then two years of, uh, it, you know, being made. And then one of the, the craziest part was is we were coming back from the glasgow film festival uh right th right as the week before everything shut down mm. so we were we were had plans to promote the film and actually tour with the film and take it to the theaters and all that kind of stuff and everything just kind of fell apart you know obviously mm -hmm. um uh, man it's a really cool film and, and as long as we're in 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 the discussion about it let's just keep going um have have you acted before this or is this your first acting job well you know if you count high school yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. In high school. And then I have a friend of mine that's a playwright and he wrote a play called Pluck the Day that was uh, done here in Dallas at Second Thought Theater. And he had written a part in for me, but the most part of that was I was just the uh, drunken guy in the lawn chair that never spoke all day, all, you know, all the, throughout the play, except for one poignant moment at the end, you know, mm -hmm. kind of deal. But they used music, used my music. And so that was kind of, uh, that was the only extent up until, you know, the film. Yeah, well, man, <laughs> you ought to do more film because uh, you were, I, I kind of had a feeling it was your first because I'd never seen you anything, but man, you were a natural. And, and I don't know oh. that, if that's because you felt, you and Josh felt comfortable together and you were playing a, a part that wasn't a stretch at all for who you are in a lot of ways or what it was, but man, it, it, you were terrific. Thank you so, you know, it really means a lot because it was, it, it's always been, uh, you know, when you were, when you're a musician and, and you are put into acting or you're an actor and you're put into being a musician or whatever, or any kind of deal, is that you obviously have some self doubt about, you know, the ability of doing it. But I think it's one of those things that just, if there's performance, if you perform, you perform. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, you, you understand that, that concept. And I'm lucky enough that I have friends of mine that are in the acting world and, and just advice that they give. And, you know, and, and this is my, as, as somebody that's been only in one movie, <laughs> I'll say my, my advice is, you know, acting is more reacting than it is mm -hmm. acting. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's the reaction of the, the, your surroundings and people they're in. And it's, and it's basically just, being that you know how you would normally exist in mm -hmm. the real world you yeah. know yeah um, yeah well you are very natural in it um actually man one of the things that i teach is public speaking um uh, i recently retired from professing at texas a&m for many years and uh you know i'm also a singer songwriter so that's performance i've done a little bit of theater but a lot of my teaching it's acting. I mean, I'm performing uh, right. in a lot of ways. I call what I do edutainment. But uh, uh, but in teaching public speaking, one of the things that that interesting things that happened to me a few years ago, and it's a long story, but I ended up co-teaching a public speaking workshop with a guy I went to high school with in Virginia who is a legit Hollywood actor and acting coach. And and uh, it was amazing to me how many of our methods and our ideas and our exercises and our rehearsals and our practice, the whole thing, it was, it was basically the same thing, you know, right. the same thing. So, yeah, man, I can, you know, you're, you're, it's still damn hard. And I think most people playing that part would, would not be natural and it would, would struggle. And you just, you yeah. seem like you were being yourself. Well, you know, I think one of the things that people don't realize too, film, is that in most cases, in most days, we had only five people on set because mm -hmm. it was such a small mm -hmm. production, such a small budget, didn't have any, you know. So you would act and then you would go move lights and ah. you would strike set and you would do all. And so your time to process or time to think about what you were doing and like it really get inside of your head you didn't have it it was just okay let's set this up and now go yeah let's set this up now go yeah and so i think that's one of the deals is like i feel like sometimes if we give ourselves enough time to think we'll, we'll outthink ourselves right right that's you know right. And, and so uh, giving me the offer that was actually a great thing for me is not having to sit and rudiment on like what i'm about to do is just getting there and, and getting it done yeah yeah um did you you know one difference between that and and say performing music live i mean you can if depending on the gig if you if you make a big mistake or you forget something or whatever you you can start a song over but you generally don't you just power through it and, and later go right. man, man but i'm just curious how often did you just have to go Cut, man. Let me do that scene over. That sucked. Let me try that again. Well, you know, there, there was there was a lot of that, but you know, there was a lot. Of, one of the things that that was Josh is really great about as a as a director is that um, 
and as a writer, the, the, the script was written and we pretty much did the shots like they were written in the, in the, the dialogue, like it was written, but then there was room to mm -hmm. float around mm -hmm. in it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so making the mistake or and my thing was, I started just judging, just trusting him and not, not going, Hey, stopping. Mm -hmm. Cause you find out like a two is one of the things we may start it. And in the process, not even actually stop filming, but he'll go hit that again. Mm -hmm. Because the, so much of the process of what you see is edited. Right. So especially with us, we shot with one camera. So you're set up to shoot this one point of point of view. And so you may only use 20 seconds of that point of view. Mm -hmm. As long as you get some dialogue and some footage, it can be moved into the right spot. So you just kind of started trusting those moments and just kept moving. Mm -hmm. Early on, I, now I can watch the film. For, I watched the first for the first time at a film festival recently in about two years. And I can, I can tell the first day we started shooting, mm. the last day we started shooting by how I look. I feel like I look on camera mm. about how I feel like how comfortable I was mm -hmm. at the moment of understanding what was happening. Because when I first started, I had no clue what any of this process looked like or felt like. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And, and I suppose given who the character is being a little bit uncomfortable was probably not out of, out of character in the sense that this is a guy who's, you know, he is a little bit uncomfortable in his own skin at this point in his career and his life. You know, that's, and that was, that was a whole point with Josh's uh, vision of the film was that this wasn't, this wasn't a, this wasn't supposed to feel comfortable. Yeah. You know, his, his relationship with the, the bartender, uh, that relationship they weren't supposed to just be you know clicking on like they were awkward around each other mm. and that was this whole tension of like how we kind of really are and, and nobody's on top of their game all the time mm -hmm. you know? yeah and so, one, one one cool thing about the film that i really appreciated i spent many years in dallas myself um and dallas denton um Gosh, how many years? Twenty years or something there. Uh, and and the the film really does sort of feature Dallas. It it, it anyway. I've, I've told all of my friends in Dallas, even if you're not a music fan, you ought to watch this film just because it's going to be cool. It, it it Dallas is almost a character in the film. Well, and that was another choice that Josh made, and that we kind of talked about when we were when we were doing this. And if you notice, there's no real like, there's no distant sky uh, skyline shot. You don't see Dallas from a distance. Now you see the skyline, but it's always up close to these buildings and stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the locations that we use, they don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things about Dallas is like the Dallas tears down to put up shiny new. Yeah. So a lot, so a lot of a lot of the stuff doesn't exist exist anymore. You know, uh, the uh, gym, Doug's gym. Mm. They've been in uh, deep, been a deep Ellum area for decades. It's no longer there, you know. Sons of Herman is still there, isn't it? Sons of Herman is still there, um, but there's a lot of. We were going to use White Rock Skate for the, for one of the, but it got torn down while we were waiting to film. Mm. So, but there's a lot of and there's a lot of little Easter eggs throughout the film of just, just different places in Dallas. So that if you're from Dallas you know it's Dallas. Yeah. But the whole yeah. idea was that if you weren't from Dallas, it could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, it, and, and it shows a side of Dallas that most people don't know exists. Mm -hmm. the, the lake scene, is that uh, Lake Louisville? It's actually White Rock Lake. White Rock, yeah. That makes more sense, yeah. Now, you, you're still in Dallas. Do you live in Dallas still? I do, yeah. Yeah. And, but you didn't, you weren't born there. I, I think I remember you were born outside of Waco. Is that right? Well, no, I was actually born here in Dallas, but then my folks ah. got my folks got divorced, and when they got divorced, my mom moved us back to uh, their hometown, which was a little town, a little town called Riesel, Texas, outside of Waco. Yeah, and I so I spent uh, my childhood and high school years there, mm -hmm. and then I um, 
moved to College Station, went to A and M for a while. Then I lived in Houston for a while, and now I'm and now here in Dallas. Gotcha. And uh, what? Uh, how old are you? I'm 48 years old. Okay, so hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a birth, I've got a birthday coming up tomorrow, and I'm just it's blowing my mind, man. I I, I keep saying the number. I'm like, wait, what? That, that that isn't quite right. But well, you know what's funny is I I uh, <laughs> after I turned about 44, I stopped trying to really think about my age, <laughs> and yeah. so I would tell people I was older or younger because I, I couldn't. I just stopped. Yeah, worrying about it, you know. That's why I had to pause for a second. Go, I'm forty. Right, right. I was trying to place you in terms of, you know, what music was happening. Say when you were in junior high and high school, what what were you into then? You know, like this is what's crazy. I when I was in junior high or in a junior high, I was into like hair bands and I say hair bands, but Van Halen. You know, I was yeah. like I, I was a Van sure. Halen kid. Sure. Uh, and I. Took started taking guitar lessons in eighth in eighth grade. I got a guitar for uh, my eighth grade graduation, and I went at Ray Hennings in in Waco, and I started take. I took a year of guitar lessons there, which was funny because all I learned to do was play scales and chords. I never actually learned to play a song, which was frustrating. <laughs> but uh, though there's some value time, in that, yeah. But at that time, at that time, my my guitar teacher's name was Troy Von Haven. He asked me what I wanted to learn. And I said, well, I want to play like Eddie Van Halen. And he was like, of course you do. Luck, <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so he goes, he goes, he goes, but he goes, I, he gave me a suggestion. He goes, go find, he goes, do you have any other guitar players that you like? And I said, I, I don't know. And uh, he goes, go find a guitar magazine and just find out about different guitarists. And it just so happened that the cover of that guitar magazine uh, was Steve Ray Vaughan and uh it was the image from cross the crossfire photos taken from that that album era and that was the first time i'd ever heard of him and i bought the cassette tape at sound warehouse in waco and i came home and listened to it and the next guitar lesson i said change i changed that i want to be steve ray vaughn yeah. he goes yeah. good luck and he goes good, good luck kid. <laughs> yeah so but but at that point it moved me into like for a lot of people that, that discovered stevie is like it moved me into this direction of discovering other blues music yeah and doing that backwards uh dig to you know going from the point of other electric blues guys his influence to the point you go all the way back to the acoustic country blues and delta you know the mm -hmm. Those those guys like the Lightning Hopkins and Mississippi John Hurts and mm -hmm. Furry Lewis and all these the mm -hmm. those and it was so funny is like here I am now in high school and that's the majority of what I'm listening to is my friends are listening to the current and I'm still listening to the current stuff but mm -hmm. when they would check out my tape collection they were like what is all this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then when I got into college of course it was or my last year in high school and, and into college was grunge music mm, yeah and then and then when i was at AM, i got introduced to robert Earl king mm -hmm. and it uh changed my perspective of how music can be done mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a sense that i hadn't heard i'd heard country grew up obviously with country music but that wasn't really country music to me right, right. It, it was kind of this weird folk hybrid mm -hmm thing songwriter i don't know you know it was just a, it was different it, but it's like I, I asked a guy one time and this was during that time how uh, how do you how would you describe he was saying he loved loved some of my songs I said, how would you describe my music and he said i don't know man smart guy with guitar uh which yeah, that's which a great is, <laughs> yeah yeah but but that's that there was a there was an intelligence to what Lyle and Robert Earl and those guys were doing that was that yeah that seemed and, and you know, which goes which goes back into the the towns and guy and mm -hmm. Blaze and those that and, and Jerry Jeff you know th those guys from the seventies that and Michael Martin Murphy those that were there that were their influences yeah you know and that's the like that's one of the things I always have done is like I, if I find somebody I like I always go well who did they like exactly because then that gives you an, uh, like this mm -hmm. 
perspective of what that is and yeah. what this music is and where it comes from and, and how to, you know, continue it with some, uh, I guess, reverence, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of that, man, um, I one of my obsessions is Bob Dylan. I always ask people, you know, about their thoughts on Dylan. And I mean, almost any songwriter we can name, if you went back to who their influence was, it's Dylan probably was there in one way or another. Yeah, yeah. What, 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 you know, you probably came to that party a little bit late, but, but what, what has been your, you know, your, your relationship with Dylan, so to speak? What, how do you think? Of uh, it? Yeah, I, that's the thing is like, I love Dylan I, and I, I do, you know, I'll do Buckets of Rain at, at shows and stuff. It's one of my favorite tunes, uh, but I love Dylan, you know, and, and, you know, we got in this conversation with some people, or some friends of mine, we did, they were doing a Prine tribute, uh, and somebody goes, well, you know, the thing I love about Prine is that he's got some boogers in there. As far yeah, as he does. And I, and I go, well, but honestly, every songwriter does. So does Dylan, Dylan man. So does, Dil so does Dylan. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, but overall, like, I can go, I think the thing is I like about Dylan, too, is that he's, he's transformed and changed through the times and never stayed. He's never became, he ne to me, he never became old man songwriter. Right. Yeah. Um, I think Paul Simon kind of falls in that same mm -hmm. realm. I, you know, it's hard to find anyone besides like Dylan and Paul Simon that, or, or those guys that have had relevant hits mm -hmm. in every decade that they've played. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not, and not just as an, as a tribute act, but actually had tunes that people were like, oh, wow, this is, yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, and I find Dylan that, to be like, you know, and his writing can be very poetic and be very, or it can be very just straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, it's, he's very diverse, you know, and he can be polarizing to people because, the, you know, a lot of people are go, well, I don't like his voice. Mm -hmm. Well, which one? <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, it's like. I but mean, I, I listen I, to the I, Nashville I, Nashville Skyline records, and I mean, come on, how can you not like that voice, for example? Oh, I know, you know. But the thing is, like, I, that's I think the deal is like, Dil, like I always go like, songwriters like Dylan inspire me to be a better songwriter. Amen. And I think, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, for me, that's beyond just in the enjoyment of hearing those tunes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So one of the what if questions I like to ask people is. Um, we get done with this this call and someone knocks on your door and you go to the door and it's Bob Dylan. And he says, hey, Greg, I, I understand you're a songwriter. Play me one of your songs. What would you play? Uh, there's two songs. There's two songs that I, I that I obviously uh, would be easy to say this world won't break. Yep. But um, but still I fall is a is a tune. It's also in the film, but it's. Uh, on the record, uh, songs for a bluebird, uh, which is oh, your buddy, your buddy in the film talking to change in the title, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a cool song, man. But you know, and that was, and that song, I was the first moment that I go, okay, this is uh this is a bit of poetry. This is, um, mm -hmm. and, and and on the time that I wrote it, um, I thought it was kind of clever. But I wasn't really, I wasn't really putting together the meanings of the of the lyrics that I was writing together, and and it wasn't until years later I went back and looked at it. And I go, they they fit in my, they fit perfectly mm -hmm. in the in the tone and the language and this of how they go together. Yeah, that's so you important. Know? That's so important. And and I go, that's to me. That was the most complete at that point that I'd written. You yeah, know. I concur, man. Now, I think that's one of your best songs. Uh, thank you. Uh, and and um, it is clever, but it's not clever in a precious way, you know. Yeah, it's it's the thing is, it's like I it's I just I grew up around a lot of old people <laughs> growing up. I spent a lot of my grandparents, a lot both sets of my grandparents growing up. And I grew up with a lot of old sayings and a lot of cl mm -hmm. cliched type things, but not cliched in a, mm -hmm. you know, cliched kind of way. Yeah. 
uh, just old say, and 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 there, I kind of pull on those ideas. My grandfather, uh, believe it or not, when he was a kid, they had um, in newspapers they would actually print poems, and that was a part of the entertainment because they didn't have a radio until later on. They, didn't, they couldn't afford one, so they so he would clip poems out and put them in a book. And so still to the day, you know, up until the day he passed away, he could recite to you different uh, poems. And the thing is, is, this was a man that was a carpenter, had an eighth grade education, basically, you know, sharecropper kid that, but words and storytelling was important to him. And so I think that's my first initial, uh, you know, influence and then writing it's like that that song in particular it's just kind of i was like how would he tell it how would he say it kind of yeah. deal yeah man that's beautiful well you have um you put out some records uh, i think the first one was 2008 and then 2011 2014 do you have something in the works i hope yeah i mean i've got stuff i've got songs and, I, and i'm i've gotten to this point and it's, it's so horrible because it's uh, i've gotten so where i judge myself so harshly that i just sit on songs mm. and don't and like, well, does this what is this what I want to put out as a representation of who I am? Mm-hmm. And I think it's just one of those things like you, know, you change as a songwriter the longer yeah. you do it. Yeah. And because your influences change and your your life changes and all that kind of stuff. And so and now it's it's there's I don't have any excuse because now if it is starting over from a different as a different direction than what I did before, it's it's a, <laughs> there's been plenty of time in between the last record and now, right. you know, but there's, a, but there's still that self doubt of going, but if I put this out, does this now, what is this? Am I going to alienate the few fans I have from the, <laughs> the time before? So, yeah. I, I, but, but then at that point, but you know, a lot of it too, is just being able to afford to do it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, we do live in an era where, uh, you can self-produce and put out pretty, pretty high quality stuff. Yeah. If you want to. yeah that's, that's kind of been my direction at this point right now is just trying to get that you know, we can be satisfied with, you know, one of the things going back to Dylan, you know, they, it's, it's, uh, they asked him at one point, you know, with all this new equipment, mm-hmm. would you ever record some of these songs again? And he was like, why? Right. I did it already. Yeah. I've already done that yeah yeah because you know, those the first albums were like one or two microphones in the in the room and they were capturing the drums and everything but that's part of the magic of that yeah and so i think one of the things when you get problems with home recordings or home productions is that you have too much time to work on it uh so you'll work it to death and yep. release it you yep. know yeah. So um, I know, I know you put out a live record, but maybe, maybe that's one answer is you get, yeah. you, you get a, uh, you know, a couple of nights someplace and, and get some real good recording equipment, somebody to help well, you I have, and come up with another. I have, yeah. I have uh, two other live recordings. One from uh, that we did at city tavern here in Dallas that came out really nice. And one from Rockwood music hall in New York. Which came out really nice. One of the things about like the the Hotel Cafe live record that I have, one thing about like Hotel Cafe and Rockwood Music Hall that a lot of venues might take follow suit in is that they offer board recordings to the artist uh, for a pretty nominal fee. I mean, it's nice. like you know thirty bucks, and you can use wow. whatever you can use it for whatever you want. You know, and that's so really cool. And so that's what we did. And then both of the, so my thought process now is to actually just pull together the best of those uh, three shows and release something along that lines as I'm putting, you know, getting this next project uh, together and out, you know. So, so let me ask you, you said you don't want to, you've thought about, well, do I want to alienate what fans I do have? How would you describe if you put out, the next record the way you envision it the way you want it to sound how would you describe the difference between that and your previous recording oh man you know the uh, the style of songwriting in a lot of ways has moved more 
like in like a uh, bluesy, weightsy type of okay. realm, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's not. It's not as Americana. I mean, not Americana, but like uh, it's not as. I think the last two records were very country. Yeah, to to an extent, but it wouldn't be as. It wouldn't be really that that direction. I mean, yeah, I, man, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. I hope we do. Uh, well, let me hit you with some, as we wind down here, let me hit you with a bunch of uh, kind of rapid fire questions. Okay. You don't have to have two or three word answers if you don't want to, but but the idea is just say, you know, what comes to mind here. Uh, this is a really tough one. If not music, what? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, I honestly, it's, it's, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a I tough mean, one. I've, I've done carpentry work and I've worked in kitchens. That's pretty much what I've done most of, okay. but, you know, I've been doing this for so long. Okay. Um, funniest uh, thing that's happened to you on the road? Oh, man. And that's probably could be a long story, but maybe. A... Oh, yeah. There's, there's over the, over the time, time of doing this, there's been all kinds of moments, but. Uh, I just say this, don't, uh, so as, as a traveling musician and, and not having a whole lot of money, a lot of times you go to shows and people offer to give you a place to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's actually the owner of the, of the bar has a mm -hmm. place for you to stay. And I used to do that a lot when I was younger, mm -hmm. but I don't do it much anymore because there's, what they don't tell you is the, the the where they have you to sleep is a closet or a or a, on a on a couch where everybody's party until five thirty in the morning or yeah yeah. Uh, yeah you don't you know uh when you're eighteen that's cool when you're forty eight that's <laughs> yeah when you're, you're when you're forty eight it's not a good but I did do is I did a, this show in in uh, uh Taos and I did a radio spot a radio interview for the local radio show and. That was interesting because the guy, let's just say, you know, uh, weed is legal in, in, <laughs> in New Mexico. And I've never been on the radio with so much dead air uh, because he would get so sidetracked and forget about what he was going to ask. And then as we left, there was a storm was coming through and he was standing outside of the, the it was in a Airstream trailer and he was standing outside of the Airstream trailer holding a uh, cooler. And it's raining, and we w drove by. We rolled down the window. It's like, is everything okay? He goes, I'm oh, just collecting a little rain. I'm like, you could just set. <laughs> so I mean, wow. There, wow. There's, there's, I bet there's, there's other stories that probably couldn't be told and should yeah, be told. Yeah, sure. I'm sure. <laughs> what, uh, what are you listening to right now? What's the last thing you listen to, or the thing that that you're listening to most often right now? You know what's crazy is most of, mostly I put on like uh jazz stations on the on uh oh um uh, apple music in the house and you know like coltrane and, and miles davis and uh uh chet baker i love chet baker's voice i love that that style um and then blues stuff uh mm -hmm. you know and then my kiddo gets in the car and i let them mm -hmm. uh play the music and I, li I love it because it keeps me uh in tune with what's happening in the world of, yeah. of music you yeah. know uh, uh and that's because uh, that's the deal you know some people go oh there's no good music made anymore no good music or no it's like there's so much of it out there that it, you know you can't even keep yeah. up with it yeah. and uh, and it's, it's, you need you need a young voice in your ear when you get to my age you need a young voice in your ear going hey this is cool this is actually cool dad yeah you know uh great man that's great. And, and, and yeah, when someone says that there's no good music these days, I'm like, okay, you, you lack imagination and you don't, you're not paying attention. But anyway, um, if, if you, uh, if you could only listen to one album for the next month and that's all you can listen to, what would it be? Oh, you know, this is, I can just, I can always say that one of my, my desert Island records is this, uh, Mississippi, John Hurt Vanguard. Uh, off Vanguard label record that's um, it's 
basically like all the good ones, which they're all great. But but, I, but there's a it, that record always puts me in a it gives me a, a a peace of mind. Okay, it's it's, it's com, com, comforting <laughs> in a way because okay. right. I feel like I feel like it's a, I feel like it's about like a, like a grandfather telling you stories and then you can just kind of you know. Yep. Yep. Good man. What what pisses you off? Oh man, where do I get started? <laughs> You know what pisses me off is that I guess I guess the thing is what pisses me off is that uh, the most is is people that are assholes to other people. Yeah. People that and people that um, won't give uh, the benefit of the doubt to people that are different. Yeah. I, I, I intolerance is is what pisses me off. I think. <laughs> and it seems to be getting worse. Um, and I I think it's probably fed by social media as much as anything but um i think yeah i think i think that we're we're insulated into our own thoughts by yeah. the algorithms and all the the you know you can you can sit there and and find anybody that agrees with you yeah yeah and, and form a whole group and then that, that you know it's just it doesn't lend to being uh, inclusive and open to other people's thoughts and that we're all just because because ultimately you know the whole Buddhist thing is we're all just trying to uh, ease our own pain and suffering. Yeah, yeah, you know, and our in whatever way we in whatever that way that make, helps us get through the day, as long as it's not hurting someone. Yeah, you know. It's a, well, and speaking of the Buddha, um, and you kind of made reference there to the four noble truths. Really, do you have any guiding philosophy or spirituality? Yeah, and it's basically um do no harm it's the, it's that deal it's my you know and and i mean i grew up in lutheran church and uh i you know <laughs> i've kind of researched all kinds of different religions in, in, in a lot of ways i i did a lot of reading about native american religions when i was in when i was a lot younger in my 20s mm -hmm. and there's just a the just the philosophy of ultimately it's just i take the philosophy of be good and kind to people and and that's the that's yeah i mean that's i think that's the way to live I, I don't know yeah well actually you know someone asked the dalai lama and of course it's hard to even talk about him these days because of that weird thing that just happened recently oh yeah i know yeah. That, that, yeah. but but um they asked him what his religion is how do you describe his religion he said kindness that's yeah it. yeah um all right, man. Cool. Thank you for that. And um, let's see. You let's say you have a young nephew or somebody very young in your family who says, "Hey, hey I want to be a songwriter." What's your What's your advice for him? Uh, what can I do to help? Great. I mean, I, 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 because the thing is, it's like you know, you don't have to do it. I'm not going to say you have to do it as a career. Yeah. yeah. But you want to be a songwriter. Awesome, because that I mean, for me, and I'll just say this: for me, writing songs when I first got started doing writing songs and play, and actually playing them, it was and live. It was about uh, therapy in a lot of ways, or like it was a it was a way for me to go. Am I the only one that screwed up? I and mean, then yeah. realizing you're not, because yeah. other people people other people identify with what you're talking about, and so it's a way of you know, dealing with life. So yeah, I, how can I help you? You need a yeah, guitar. That's great, yeah, that's great. I've never heard that answer, and I love it. Um, I was just listening to um, this morning, listening to Otis Gibbs talking to Peter Case, and really interesting interview. And one of the things Peter Case talked about was when he was three or four years old, he kind of faced death for the first time. His uh, he said the next door neighbor lady he used to give him cookies and candy died and he hit he was you know he had that first revelation of oh shit we're gonna we die and she's gone yeah. uh and you know as 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 i get older i i think about it more and more and um I'm, i've been pretty obsessed with philosophy most of my life so like you I've, I've read into a lot of these folks i wonder if you have any particular views on death or what happens after we die or anything of that nature any, any thoughts you have so uh i went on the trip one time uh 
I had a little, I had a little experience with a psilocybin. Okay. And and I, I went through the universe, and I, and I had this whole warm feeling the entire time. And at the, in the process of this, I go, "Is this what it is to die? Mm. This is what it, this is what it feels like to die." And I got this really like calm feeling. It's like, if this is if this is it, I'm okay. I can handle I can handle the way that I feel right. This this is pretty great. <laughs> now, that being said, is that what happens? I don't know. Yeah, probably not. Maybe who knows? I don't really know what happens when we die. I, I think that one of the best answers I've ever heard given to that question was from Keanu Reeves on the Stephen Colbert show, and he basically said, "I think there's going to be a lot of people that miss us," mm. and I think that's one of the, I think really in death. I mean, if you think about if you think about falling asleep at night, you don't realize you're asleep until you wake up, mm -hmm. right? So, death for the person that dies is not the is not the problem. Yeah. It's everybody. It's every, it's everything that happens around the person that dies. Yeah. That that's where the grief comes from. The person is when you die, there's no grief for you. Right. Right. You don't have any personal grief anymore. Yeah. so to speak so i mean it just depends on, on what your perspective is i guess of the afterlife i'm hoping there's something maybe mm -hmm. but it's okay if there's not because i won't know any different that's right <laughs> yeah 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 and it's one of those interesting things because first of all we can't know um yeah. right, they call it faith and when someone has faith in something like that because you can't know but yet so you would think the healthy way is say well I, i'm not even going to worry about it because there's nothing i can do about it and yet for centuries, philosophers have grappled with this, and it's you know the wisdom traditions are full of speculation. It, it's kind of one of those tantalizing things that, on one hand, we can't know and never can. On the other hand, we can't not think about it. But yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I just say it's 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 the basic it's the basic thing that drives everything that we of our existence. Amen. Every, everything everything that we do is the fact that we can't handle our own immortality. Yeah, I mean, I've never yeah. heard it quite so succinctly when when uh, Steve Allen asked Jack Kerouac why he wrote On the Road, and he said, "I wrote it. I wrote that book because we're all going to die." Yeah, there you go. I mean, <laughs> that's just one of those things. Is that, and but we we've, we've created religions, we've created uh, stories that that of people that you know, Dracula and zombie movies is the afterlife for people that don't believe in a heaven and a hell. Mm. right it's to yeah. be able to it's be able to it's be able to keep living past the time you're supposed to be here mm -hmm. so everything that we've created on this planet pretty much is our struggle with our own immortality right yeah right on man and last last question have have you um i'm just going to guess you're a guy who's probably visited gravestones of maybe some old blues masters or uh is, is yeah true I've done that actually. Yeah. Do you recall any interesting? Um, what do we call the saying on a gravestone? Is that the epitaph? I don't know. But what do you recall any interesting ones that you've seen on gravestones? Not really. I just recall interesting things that people leave. Okay. The other people who leave that when they visit, you know, that's uh, you know, of course, the blind lemon ones is uh, keep my. I believe it says you know keep my graveside okay, clean. clean. Yeah. Yeah, the, from from the song, you know. yeah, yeah, um, and then I'm, I'm trying to think. I went to Mance Lipcomb's uh, several years ago, and I can't remember um, what it actually said on the stone. But I do just I know I know exactly where it's at now. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, like, so the reason I asked is I'm. I'm I'm curious if um, if you were asked right now, what is your gravestone going to say? You get to write it. What does it say? Oh, well, I just I know what it'll look like, but uh, I don't know what it will actually say. There, we were I went one time. It was in Paris. And we went to the the cemetery where uh, Jim, Jim Morrison. Morrison. Yeah, yeah. As we're walking through their cemetery, you know, they have these big above ground catacomb type things and I don't know that's really not a catacomb but anyway they, one of them ha had the top was slid over to one side and there was a brass arm coming out 
coming out of it like the somebody was climbing out of the grave yeah which i thought was hilarious is yeah. like that's the, i would have liked to known that person when they were alive because that's a sense of humor i yeah. would have enjoyed being yeah. around so maybe something like that yeah, <laughs> yeah. I saw I saw one once that said I, I told you I was sick. <laughs> hey Greg, man, thank you so much for uh thank for doing so this. Sad. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I, I love your music and I'm I'm hoping that you're gonna put something out again soon. I I uh I did I have been looking at your your gig schedule. I'm not too far from Dallas and some of the places you play, so uh I'm gonna come see you sometime soon and I'll holler at you when I do. Yeah, yeah no, thanks again. All right, man, take care. All right. Bye-bye.